Hi, welcome to the Bioinformatics chat. Today I am talking to Sergey Nurk, who is a postdoc at the NIH. Hi, Sergey. Hello, nice to be here. And Sergey Koring, uh, who is a staff scientist at the NIH. Hi, Sergey. Hey, thanks for having us. And we will be talking today about genome assembly and about the classic assembler canoe. But before we get to, to the topic of the genome assembly, um, this is the first time I have anyone from the NIH on the podcast. And so I'm, I'm very curious, guys, if you could um, talk about your experience working at the NIH. How did you end up there? What are you doing there? And how is different from working at a normal research institute or a university? So um, this is Sergey Korn. I can go first, I guess. Um, I've been at the NIH for about five years now. Um, and I ended up there together with Adam Philippi, who is uh, our group PI. Uh, we were actually at the same place together. I worked with him for almost 10 years now. Um, and we transitioned together to the NIH to start uh, the research group that's there now. Um, before that, we were at the National Bioforensic Analysis and Countermeasure Center, which is hard to say, but it was based in Frederick in Maryland, and it was primarily a lab for the FBI um, run by the as a contract for DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and it kind of provided the support for investigation. So based on the original uh, Amerithrax mailings, when someone mailed uh, anthrax powder to the senators and other people like in the media, um, the government decided that they needed to have capability to analyze this in-house. Uh, because at the time they had relied on Tiger to do the analysis. Um, and so we worked at this lab, which was, we were doing technology development. So seeing how best we could analyze these types of data, but also providing support for actual ongoing investigations. Um, and we were there at an exciting time because they had the first back biosequencer and we were working on making that useful for microbial data, because that's obviously of great interest to this kind of forensic lab. Um, and as the instrument kind of got more and more mature, and we started sequencing things like goats and cattle with our collaborators at the USDA, um, we figured the Department of Homeland Security is going to frown on us using our resources and time to improve agricultural products and not necessarily related to biodefense. Um, and so when this opportunity in the NIH came up and Adam applied for it, um, it seemed like a great opportunity to continue our research with long reads uh, with maybe a little bit more flexibility of topics. Um, and the NIH has been really great so far. I, you know, I mostly have experience with the NHGRI, which is the institute we're in. I can't speak for uh, the other institutes, but I know that NHGRI has been extremely good. Um, they're very flexible about the kind of work we do, even though we're the human genome research and we certainly do human research. Uh, in terms of genome assembly, we also have a lot of freedom to work on other projects. We've had the same USDA collaborations. We've had this large collaboration with the Vertebrate Genome Project, working on uh, assembling all the ex uh, all the vertebrate genome species. Um, and and the chair has been supportive of all those projects. Um, and you know, in terms of, I haven't had as much experience working in a university as a PI or as a professor. Uh, only as my during grad school, but you know certainly there's less pressure than NIH to be submitting grants and writing grants. Uh, we do have reviews uh, by external uh, investigators who come in, and you have to give a research proposal and the plan, and then evaluate what you've done uh, over the past period and what you're planning to do, and give you a rating and say whether you're doing science that is worth continuing to fund or not. Uh, but it's you know a lot less intense, and there's a lot l you spend less time preparing for that than you would in terms of writing grants. I feel like in a university as a professor. It's Sergey Nurk now. Uh, I can say from the postdoc's perspective, uh, so far it has been great. Um, I also don't need uh, to apply to any you know additional grants, and I can focus on uh, my work. And um, Adam as a PI uh, is great. And uh, he gives a lot of freedom uh, and a lot of, you know, opportunity uh, to choose what projects you are interested in. And you can collaborate with other people uh, in the group and other people in the, uh, in the institute as much as you um, 
think um, is pr productive uh, for your research. Um, and um, our institute and our lab in particular are a part of you know big consortiums. So we um, we are in the in the midst of it all. <laughs> so uh, I think Serge can tell you more about his work on uh, VGP consortium and uh, others um, later if you're interested. And uh, of application actually of Kanu and High Kanu to those uh, consortiums as well. Um, but uh, I also wanted to say that um, probably compared to like a standard university, there is maybe more uh, bureaucracy, I think, in uh, in NIH because it's uh, like you know governmental institutions, and uh, um, I had to pass through all different security checks and so on. And I was waiting for my laptop for two months. But then you know coming from Russia. Um, I'm pretty used to bureaucracy, so <laughs> as long as you conform to the rules, um, you're good. Um, and um, the IT has been very supportive and we have amazing computational resources that we can use on a daily basis without um, almost any restrictions, uh, which has been very, very useful for, uh, for my work so far. So, oh, and there is also a huge community of postdocs from all around the world. NIH is a huge, uh, so NIH in Bethesda has a huge campus. And I know that, I, I don't know, there are like, you know, thousands, thousands of postdocs. Uh, and they are organizing different events and going to museums or to the concerts or just to the restaurants or organizing some lectures. Um, so it has been fun. Awesome. So let's talk about Canoe. And Sergey Koyrin, you were one of the original, I guess, authors of Canoe, but also Canoe has an interesting story uh, coming from the Solera assembler. Uh, so can you retell uh, that story? Yeah, so um, the Solera assembler uh, kind of came out of uh, Solera Genomics, which was the company that Craig Venter founded to uh, beat the public effort to sequence the human genome project. Um, and so it was really one of the first, the, uh, the first, uh, assembler designed for whole genome shotgun data that could scale to these large eukaryotic genomes. So the first paper describing it, uh, was actually this Drosophila paper, um, explaining how they assembled the Drosophila genome and scaffolded it with Sanger data at the time. Um, and uh, so when Solera uh, essentially sh largely shut down and most of the people who had worked on the assembler left and went to the J. Craig Venster Institute, Institute, which was a nonprofit uh, research institute, um, they ended up open sourcing uh, Solera assembler. Uh, and so it's been kind of open source maintained since then. Um, and uh, I came into when I originally switched to bioinformatics from doing software engineering and kind of traditional working at Amazon, et cetera, type work. Um, <clears throat> I joined the uh, Tiger, which is the Institute for Genome Research at Rockville. Um, and there was a group there which worked on genome assembly because Tiger had been doing a lot of assembly and finishing of microbial genomes and had moved into the space of doing mosquito and uh, other genomes. When I joined, the first project I worked on was actually a tick genome which was one of the worst genomes uh, ever to work on. Um, and partially we found out because they had actually sequenced two different, there were two different tick colonies from different parts of the United States that they crossed in a lab and then sequenced those, a whole pool of them be to get enough material of DNA, which no one considered, you know, who had planned the sequencing. They didn't think about the fact that we're introducing a lot of variability in the tick populations, and that's all reflected in the read. So it was really hard to do a reasonable assembly of that data. Um, but this was kind of my exposure, first exposure to bioinformatics. And so there were two separate groups at the time when I started. There was one group in Tiger, which ran the Solar Assembler and then made contributions to the open source. And then there was a group at the J. Craig Venter Institute, uh, which had a lot of the alums from Solera actually. Um, who worked on, you know, more algorithm development and other features. And shortly after I joined Tiger, it merged with JCVI and it became just JCVI, J. Craig Venter Institute. Um, and so the two groups merged and I started working more directly on the Solar Assembler. Um, and one of the first projects I worked on there was adapting it to the new uh, 
era of short reads, which were 454 reads at that time. Um, and so it was kind of a, a fortunate time to join Bioinformatics because it was the time when I remember when I first joined Tiger, we had these meetings where it was kind of like, well, should we get 7x coverage or 8x coverage? You know, we would save $100,000 if we did 7x. <laughs> Um, right. And all these projects were kind of like, yep, we're going to get 7x. Maybe this project will push it to 6x because we want to save money. <laughs> um, but then this whole uh, field got opened up in a huge way by the short read era and all the sequencers coming out from Illumina, uh, 454, you know, solid, all these different options that hadn't been available that made the tools have to change and that I was fortunate enough to work on several of them. Um, and so uh, I worked on the Solar Assembler and a JCVI on adaptations to it for the 454 data, for using it to finish genomes easier, which was a thing people did at the time, which people would now no one would do. But uh, we, we did still at that time, um, if you had a microbial genome and you had some gaps, you would do primer walking into the gap. And so then you want to, when you're assembling, you know that those reads should go into the middle of this gap, right? And so you can localize that in the assembly algorithm and constrain them. Um, so those are some of the early things I worked on with Solar Assembler. Um, and then I got lured away to this uh, uh, National Biodefense Center that I mentioned before uh, by Adam with the promise that there was the sequencer called the PacBio and they had the first uh, commercial installation of it and they wanted to use it. And you know, no one really at the time knew if it was going to be useful or not uh, or how useful. And so it just seemed like it had a lot of promise. Um, I had seen presentations of it because they had come um, Steven Turner had come from PacBio to JCVI to try to convince JCVI and us to adapt Solar Assembler to that data. Um, at the time, it was really early data. I think it was maybe at best a thousand bases long reads with 30% error or so. Um, and they had this thing called strobe reads, which were kind of like paired end reads, but more than two pairs. Um, and uh, so I got lured away by the promise of working on this. And I, that was when I first adapted Solar Assembler to these long reads by doing this kind of hybrid assembly where you corrected the noisy data from PacBio with more accurate data from Illumina or 454. Um, and then we contributed that back into the Solar Assembler, which was at the time still primarily maintained by JCVI. Um, and later on, a couple of years later, the opportunity came to hire uh, one of the main engineers from that group, Brian Wallens. Uh, into our lab, which we did. Um, and that's when we kind of set him to the task of throwing away all the changes in Solar Assembler that we didn't really need, the things that had been adapted to 454 reads or to Illumina reads, uh, or even old Sanger support, like scaffolding Sanger data. Um, and we set him to throw all that away and clean up into the third version of Canoe, the CA started 3G was the original name. And so we decided we needed something more pronounceable than the CA through G. And that's when we came up with the name Canoe, and it's essentially been um, surprisingly successful. I've been surprised by how popular it has been. Um, but that's so. Kind how of did long... you come up with that name? Um, so we, you know, we spend an inordinate amount of time coming up with names. Actually, it's kind of a shame, a shameful part of how long we think about our names for our tools, given how bad some of them have been. Um, but we had had this PVCR, which is a terrible name. I'll admit, or PAG Bio to CA, which was the name for our original correction process. Um, and we didn't want an acronym because uh, they tend to be very hard to pronounce and not very easy for people to remember. And so we were thinking of, um, you know, at the time I was also working uh, with our colleague Todd Trangen, who is now at the University of Rice, who had been working on other projects and was interested in the shipbuilding and kind of how you do like overlapping structure of the ship when you overlap the wood boards. There's different ways to construct ships where you either overlap or abut the wood and things like this. And so, hey, overlapping assembly. Um, and we decided to go with a kind of boat theme and we wanted to name it a canoe. Uh, but we were afraid that canoe is not a very easy to spell word for non-English speakers. So we decided to just shorten it and make it, you know, the phonetic version of canoe. That's a smart move. Yeah. And see, and it has the advantage that it's uniquely spelled. So it's easier to find in the field actually named it the proper canoe, right? Yeah, that's a good move. The only uh, name for bioinformatics software that I've ever come up with was spades. And it's not super easy to Google. <laughs> because it's also a game, right? Because it's also a, a card and it's also a small shovel. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. 
Wait, are, are you saying you were the one who invented the name Spades? Yeah. Wow, that's that's another story that we we <laughs> definitely will yeah, hear we, later. We also we also spent spent a lot of time uh, picking <laughs> out the name, and uh, yeah, I, I can tell you it later. But yeah, I, I think I think I was the one who so suggested who suggested Spades. Wow. Okay. So and and then the the canoe was born. Was was it true that from the start you were targeting specifically the the long reads, or at least as long as they were? At the time, so on the one hand, you were using the uh, Solera assembler, um, or the at least the general framework from it, and uh, you were targeting the the long read. So, was there any particular reason why the ideas behind the Solera assembler were well suited for long read assembly, or was it simply, you know, a, a historical? sort of accident that, that that's that was what you were familiar and that was what you were working with um i mean it was it was partially that we were familiar with it and um you know it the ideas are kind of applicable because if you look a lot of the assemblers that have been developed for the um long reads with the exception of fly have followed the same string graph or overlap graph approach which is what um Solar assembler was originally built with um, and so the solar assembly actually slightly predates the string graph, which is why it uses overlap graphs uh, instead of string graphs in, in its implementation. Uh, but you know, it, that idea is kind of nicely suited to the long reads because you don't have too many of them. Um, and so you can actually look at graphs of where your nodes are the reads um, and without too, too much redundancy, right? Like you would get it within the room in the data set. Um, and you can, you have this nice feature of tolerating Errors because um, in a in a, the brown graph, which is what people have traditionally been using for the Illumina data, um, every error you have kind of adds noise to your graph, right? Because it doesn't have an overlap, and so you have to process the reads carefully to correct them and uh, all these other steps. And we could just kind of say, well, we don't care about these kind of small differences. Uh, these reads are still coming from the same locus of the genome, so it kind of naturally fell. To being applicable to long reads because they were essentially Sanga reads plus plus, right? Um, and so we were always targeting our fo my focus at least has always been on the long reads. So their assembler did the, uh, the J. Craig Venter Institute group did spend time trying to adapt it to Lumina data, but they were never very successful with it, uh, just because of you know the volume of data. Um, it just doesn't suit itself well to this overlap graph concept. Um, so. I think it was much better suited for the resurgence of these long reads um, that started with BackBio, but then certainly also when we were developing Canoe, we were very aware of the nanopore reads, which were just becoming more popular and more applicable to long, larger genomes. And so we were definitely targeting those two as our primary use cases. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. But uh, could you introduce our listeners to the, the concepts of um, overlap graphs and string graphs? Yeah, and uh, I mean, Sergey, uh, feel free to jump in too because you've been thinking about these graphs a lot recently as well. Um, the The basic idea is that in the graph is that each read uh, is a node. Um, it actually has two two nodes, um, one for each end of the read, and so then you can have other read ends attaching to um, the five prime or the three prime end of a read. And so this is a, ends up as a bidirected graph where you can essentially choose to walk a read in any direction with a constraint that if you enter through the five prime end, you have to exit through the three prime. You can't enter and exit through the same end of the read. Um, but and so uh, just to clarify, the reason for that complexity is that you don't know from which strand the the particular read comes from, right? Right. Each read could have been read from an arbitrary strand, so you have to. Uh, and it's a mixture, right? So you may be walking a path where one read in your path is from the forward strand, the next read is from the reverse strand. So you have to be able to switch strands uh, as you're going along in the graph. And um, the big, I guess, distinction from the, the brown graph, which uh, you're probably familiar with or your listeners are, um, is that the reads are kind of atomic units. We don't split them up like you would in a uh, the brown graph into the kamers. Uh, you just look at the entire reads. Um, and in the overlap graph, you um, always keep the read full length. So when you find the branch and you end up at a repeat, uh, you end up with this uh, kind of non-intuitive um, 
assembly where you extend into the repeat by the length of the read that's on the end because you don't break that read. And that's the kind of the model that Solar Assembler has been using, which is sometimes good, but sometimes confusing for um, downstream users because they see that two contigants have an overlap, so they want to merge them, but you know they, they may not be mergeable. It's just that both reach into the same repeat, but that doesn't mean that they are the only ways to reach into that repeat, uh, for example. Um, and so that's where you know the, the brown graph and this a brown graph, which is what Fly is using, have an advantage because they they bluntify the ends, and so does a string graph tries to bluntify the ends, uh, so that you end right at the start of the repeat. You don't extend into the repeat by a read length. Actually, I'm not sure that originally. So yes, a string graph is a very messy notion, I think, <laughs> because yes. it has been uh, like different people consider different things of string graph. So. Gene Myers, who introduced them, didn't make it easier for people because in his own paper, uh, the description is uh, slightly, um, has slightly different, so of how to get string graph, slightly not maybe contradicts, but do not, does not very well correspond to the picture that he is giving to like illustrate them. So while illustrating them, he shows something more similar to uh, this Abrin graph, repeat graphs that uh, Misha Kalmagorov and Pavel Pevsner are using now. But in the description, uh, the string graph uh, you get from overlap graph by just removing transitive, um, transitive overlaps. And then in, uh, in the description in the paper, uh, Jim Myers actually says that it's uh, so obvious that uh, this uh, gives you the same essentially graph as the Debrun graph would give for the same set of reads if they are perfect that it doesn't uh, require any further so it's so obvious that you, you don't even need to describe it further um, and um, it is actually not true I think but, but um, uh, where are we so uh, search told you what what repeat graph is and so in in our uh, at least in our uh, group, we call by string graphs. We call they are not plantified usually, but they are the the, the overlap graphs with transitive um, transitive overlaps uh, removed. So can you can you explain it further? What what are transitive overlaps? Sure. Yeah. 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 So if uh, if you have three reads A, B, and C, and uh, A overlaps with B. Uh, then B overlaps with C and A overlaps with C. And the size of the overlap between A and C is, uh, like, you know, well corresponds, uh, to what you could infer from the other two. So from A overlap, A B overlap and B C overlap, you can try to infer what overlap between A and C should be, right? Um, given the length of, that you know the length of the reads and the overlaps. And if the, overlap that you have in the graph actually corresponds to what you would infer uh, not having it uh, explicitly, you just remove this overlap. So it simplifies the graph uh, quite a lot. And then you uh, actually indeed are getting lo this long unity path, you know, that everybody wants to uh, get in which you are uh, certain that they are part of the genome. Right, so it's, we, then we are coming to this notion of what are unitics, what are quantics, and so on. But if you then uh, the the very basic trick is to start extracting the non-branching parts in this graph. Right, and the I mean that's part of the reason of transitive reduction, right? That you're removing redundant information that would otherwise mm -hmm. look like a branch. Yeah, because otherwise you would look like you have a branch from A where you could go to B or C. Um, and yes, yeah, so I guess in my mind I think of. Um, the overlap graph as the non-bluntified version, the string graph as the bluntified version, only because most of the assemblers that have called themselves string graph, like uh, starting with Nubler for 454 data, uh, which was written by Jim Knight, um, try to bluntify the ends and, and break at the repeats, as well as Falcon, uh, which was developed by Jason Chin at BagBio, um, also bluntified. So I usually right. say overlap graph for non-blentified and string graph for blentified, but it, you know I, I agree with Sergey that the paper notion, the string graph paper doesn't is not super clear about what exactly the string graph is itself. <laughs> right, and go, going to more modern software like uh, me, uh, the, the the software by Hang, uh, 
Lee, right? Uh, Miniasm, I think he also says that he uses stream graph, right? By, as, as it is described in the paper. Uh, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't do any blantification, I guess. Maybe, maybe, uh, also let's explain in more detail what blantification is. Yeah, sure. It's uh, what uh, Serge mentioned before when, uh, you end up with, uh, uh, with overlapping unities. So you do not try, um, so essentially one, uh, region of the genome can be represented by several different overlapping contigs, which is not always what you want. And actually compared to the, um, to f the graphs that fly gets and compared to Debrin graphs, uh, it also, your graph ends up uh, being dependent on the set of the reads that you were provided with rather than, uh, only on the structure of your genome. So essentially, if you have enough coverage, uh, Debrin graph, um, and you don't have errors, uh, Debrin graph will always be the same for the particular genome. It's not like that for, uh, this non-blantified stream graphs, uh, which can be different. Uh, and, um, yeah, but, uh, I, I mean, so, so when you blantify, mm -hmm. you basically remove those overlaps. Well, you, you can't remove them from all of, all of the, so you need to pick a node, which will still have this sequence, right. And right, remove sure. it from others, but it, it's hard to do in, uh, so since there are, you know, cycles in the graph and things like that, it's hard to come up with a deterministic rule that will do it well. And, uh, it, I, 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 we were, we actually gave it some thought and it can be, um, formulated as uh, like, you know, integer uh, programming problem, uh, I think, but uh, nobody has done that. So people usually do so, some heuristics, uh, to do that. Um, and also, I don't know, but I, I think, uh, if I remember our discussions correctly, Nubler also tries to blantify so that it would like detect the repeat boundaries, right? So right. The, another problem is just if you just blantify, the results still wouldn't give you the precise boundaries of the repeats that you actually might want to know. Uh, and this is another, you know, upside of using, uh, Debrun graphs, repeat graphs that you immediately get the, the boundaries of the, of the repeats, um, which actually can be, uh, convenient for, uh, using some additional information later on to, you know, figure out what's going on. So as a like rep representation of the, of the genome, um, I think, uh, repeat graphs are in many senses, like, you know, better, but, uh, the assembly topic is a very different one. Uh, and, um, stream graphs and overlap graphs are um, still in many quite convenient now uh, for the assembly because they give you very good um, control over, you know, what overlaps you are considering and which ones you are filtering out. Uh, and um, so if you would just, so we, we talked that um, you can just extract the unitics uh, from the overlap graph. Uh, that you got, right, from the string graph. Uh, but the problem with this approach is, is that they will be much shorter <laughs> than you would like them to be. And they will be much shorter than what any genome modern so uh, assembly software will give you. So then starts the, you know, the ugly part of heuristics of uh, how you make them longer and <laughs> what uh, overlaps you can ignore what reads you can ignore, how you can resolve uh, the genomic repeats, which are essentially longer than the minimal overlap size uh, parameter that you set up. So, Right, and, and so maybe it's a good time to mention that actually, even though we've been talking about string graph and overlap graph, um, Canoe, uh, by inheritance from Stellar Assembler, actually uses a different, slightly different concept, which is the best overlap graph, which is a very simplified form of the graph. Um, and so this was first, again, proposed uh, and introduced for 454 data. Uh, but the idea is that you only allow a single edge from every end of a read. Uh, 
uh, and that's its best edge. So best you can define in different ways, but traditionally it's defined by the number of matches. Within the overlap, right? Yeah, uh, or the length of the overlap, um, something like this. But it has several advantages. Um, one is that your graph is very small um, in memory. Um, another is um, that you don't have to do any of the transitive reduction or other simplification steps because you can't have an edge from A to C and to B, right? Because uh, A will say, well, I have a bigger overlap to B. So it implicitly reduces the transitive re uh, overlaps just by that filter. Um, and this is a pretty you know, simple, greedy heuristic, but it does still build a uh, branching path. So it's not like you'll always have a non-branching path because you'll still have a read that says, well, A is my best pair, but A may say, well, you know, C is my best pair. And so you end up with this branch where B wants to go into A, but A wants to go to C. Um, and so uh, within Canoe, what we do is we build this uh, be best overlap graph. Um, and there's a lot of filtering up front because as Sergey mentioned, it's really important to, uh, you know, you, you have fine control of what overlaps you keep. And so you want to get rid of as many false ones uh, you as you can, where false ones here would mean ones that originate from uh, other repeat copies, right? So anything that comes from a different locus of the genome. So if you can tell that this overlap between two reads is from a repeat and induced by a repeat and not actually from two reads that came from the same locus of the genome, then you want to just ignore it. That will make your assembly much easier, right? Um, uh, fact, but, we, you... but we don't ignore those. No, we, we ignore the, the reads which are incorrect. But the, I, I think the problem, so we, we would have fewer problems, actually, if we really considered this graph. The problem is that we don't even cons like look at the branchings at this graph, but we try to. So, yeah, what Kanu does, I mean, I, I wouldn't suggest anybody to use best overlap graphs ever uh, because uh, they have... Uh, they have interesting problems and actually your unitigs are uh, not guaranteed to be part of the genome if you just look at the best overlaps. But right. Kanu is even messier and so it, it extracts long greedy quantics and then tries to bring overlaps back and try to see whether it, you know, resolve, whether it uh, just traversed some of the regions of uh, the genome where it actually didn't have the information. Uh, to do that, so whether it you know resolved some repeats incorrectly, so it tries to bring this information later and break the initially correct c constructed context. So this filtering that Serge mentioned is mostly we mostly need it for the initial context to be as correct as we can, although they are super like constructed in a very heuristical way. So it's a mess <laughs> and. Um, it's a legacy that we live with, but, uh, for everybody who is, you know, coming into assembly, uh, don't do that. Uh, yeah, I think given that, you know, <laughs> there are the string... number of reads and the length of the reads, you can build the string graphs or overlap yes. graphs. Yeah. Um, so now the, the cool thing about assembly now is that they, there are some, you know, algorithms and modules that, uh, you can reuse. So if you have the re have the reads, uh, you don't need to construct the, if you have the overlaps, you don't need to construct the, the string graph yourself. You just, uh, take mini asm and put the overlaps there. And there you go. You get some approximation of what you want. And then you can try to start on top of that. But in the times of, uh, of Celera, you know, we, there were not, no such software. And also there were no big enough machines to put this entire graph into a single node. And so they really had to be very minimalistic uh, with, the, uh, with the memory requirements. Uh, so that's why it uses this uh, design, but we have so much headache with it. Uh, you can't imagine. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's a good point that building an assembler is a relatively complex undertaking, right? There's a lot of modules and things that's getting easier because like Sergey said there's some reusable pieces now you can uh, put together but because of that you know there's things in Celera assembler or a canoe that like this this uh use of this module that builds this best overlap graph called bogart which you know we haven't been particularly happy with that we we're working on replacing but then it takes time because you 
you know, you first, you move one step at a time. So first you improve the previous step, then this step, then this. And so um, you kind of slowly are continually refactoring bits as you uh, get better ideas or get better approaches and things like that. And it often takes longer than you'd like to get all those things rolled out into the assembler version. So you kind of uh, work with what you have and improve it as you go. So uh, while we are uh, on the subject of uh, like the high level concepts behind assemblers and like different paradigms, uh, Sergei Nurk, I, uh, I wasn't originally planning to talk about this, but I, I just cannot pass the chance. So yeah, why, why don't you tell us also about about spades, which is <laughs> an incredibly popular assembler. Um, so what was the story behind that? And maybe how does it compare to, to Canoe in terms of its paradigm? Well, I think the only way it compares to Canoe is the messiness of the code base at this point. <laughs> Although my former colleagues are doing their best to, you know, uh, bring it to the modern software standards. And I, I would say that they are succeeding. Uh, so Space started in 2011 when uh, Pavel Pevsner, uh, my former scientific advisor, he got a big grant from a, a Russian uh, government of the Russian Federation to establish a a modern bioinformatics lab. I was in one of the original hires of that lab, mostly because I knew the guy who was organizing it. Um, and um, then, uh, yeah, I left my job. And that was in St. Petersburg? Yeah, in St. Petersburg. Yeah, I left, left my job uh, as a software engineer in Yandex and uh, joined the world of bioinformatics. Um, so and Yandex, by, by the way, for, for those who don't know, this is like the, the Russian version of Google. Yeah. Yeah, Russian version of Google plus plus because they also have like the Russian version of Uber, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I think they have more services than Google and, does even. And they they actually they also bought the Uber in Eastern Europe, I I, I believe, uh, recently. So anyway, and uh, that's what Pavel t told us to develop a genome assembler. Uh, I, I I don't. So there were some other projects um, as well. But there were many of us, and I think he, he thought that it, it's a nice way to, you know, occupy many of us. And also he was hoping that we would come up with some, uh, you know, maybe new approaches to genome assembly. Spoiler alert, we did not. And um, then, uh, but the motivation behind all this was that at this point, uh, Pavel was very excited about the new uh, technology for sequencing genomes of individual cells. And the um, motivation for this, so it's single cell sequencing, but uh, right nowadays everybody thinks about single cell RNA seq, uh, right? But uh, for us it was single cell DNA sequencing. And uh, the problem there was that um, for many microbes that are around us, uh, they're hard to culture. They're hard to cultivate, so we know that there are like in in any soil sample there are like thousands of different microorganisms. Uh, but when you start trying to get the colonies, um, only like a dozen grows or something. So a, a small, a very small, uh, uh, small part of the entire diversity. And so uh, single cell DNA sequencing. With uh, and then uh, Roger Laskin, uh, I think he was he was actually employed uh, by JCBI yep. uh, at that point. Uh, he came up with uh, this method called MDA, multiple displacement amplification, um, to try to amplify the amount of DNA that you get from essentially a single uh, microbial cell uh, to then allow uh, standard uh, sequencing. Uh, to be applied, uh, and it worked. Uh, but the problem was that these the resulting data sets they had uh, some weird properties. First of all, they the the coverage was super uneven, and um, many places of the genome were uh, not covered at all, uh, could have been missing, and this uh, really uh, messed with the assembly software that was available at the time. 
And another problem which aggravated the, the first one was that from uh, the method itself, uh, it, it resulted in uh, formation of uh, the chimeric junctions. Uh, so some of the s sequences, that some of the reads uh, that you saw were actually joined in distant parts of the genome. Uh, but the difference, for example, from uh, chimeras that you usually see in PecBio and that uh, Kanu tries to avoid uh, by pre-filtering of the reads uh, is that in, in MDA, uh, the same chimeric junction ended up being supported by multiple different reads. So, because it was actually, you know, formed as a molecule and then sequenced. And so, uh, you had to come up with a heuristic to deal with those. Uh, and, uh, just filtering by coverage didn't work because your coverage was very uneven. And so some of these chimeric junctions ended up with higher, uh, you know, read coverage than other correct genome fragments just because yeah those were so low covered and this chimeric junction formed early in the process and ended up with high coverage so um yeah and we we, we came up with some methods uh to deal with those and we were actually very much inspired uh by the work of uh, our colleagues from hong kong uh, who were developing idba uh, assembler series and in particular IDBA UD. I think it's a, an amazing piece of software which is, I think, used, being used by this day, uh, <laughs> by many labs. Um, and, um, yeah, but we, we also came up with some, some other methods based on, you know, the, uh, network flows arguments, uh, and uh, estimation of the multiplicity of different regions of the, uh, of the uh, genome, even without uh, being able to rely on uh, read coverage to do that. So yeah, that's and then we 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 continued working on it, and we were working, and it started becoming popular and was faring well in the in uh, in the independent uh, benchmarks. Uh, Serge, were you the co-author of this uh, Mazurka benchmark that really, you know, spiraled us to fame? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I worked on the Gage paper along with Adam, who did a lot of the actual validation um, for that paper as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was primarily led by Steven Salzberg. So I, I, I think the idea was to promote the Mazurka assembler. But the byproduct was that uh, Spades was faring very well in most, uh, you know, comparisons. And, um, and then, you know, since, since it was benchmark produced by the authors of Mazurka, everybody was like, oh, okay, probably we should try using Spades now. <laughs> and, so I think um, the original idea was to promote an alternative to the Assemblathon series, um, because that had been the initial benchmarking. Uh, and so uh, given the experience of, you know, everyone in Steven's lab and nearby in terms of Mazurka and having people who worked in Solar Assembler around, um, there, Steven had an interest in having an alternative to Assemblathon that was more focused on, I guess, reproducibility, where it's not, because in the Assemblathon, the first Assemblathon, people just submitted assemblies. Um, and so it was a bit hard to know how they were produced. Um, and so the gauge benchmark, one of the main ideas was that they're all run by the same person. So it's, what do you get if you run someone's assembler? Certainly if, you know, I'm running canoe, I can do better than pretty much anyone else running canoe because I know all the heuristics and tricks and tweaks. Right. Uh, but if someone takes it, what do they actually get if someone runs it without having that familiarity? Um, yeah, and I, I think it was a great idea. And also, I think Assemblaton was focused more on vertebrate genomes, right? And Gage was like the first, I think, um, initiative to try to uh, provide, the yeah. Yeah, 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 provide the, the comparison of um, microbial assembly uh, methods. And uh, I think nowadays I, the, the, there are uh, similar projects uh, live on. I, I definitely remember there was a project based on bio boxes container 
which was so the, 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 there was a, at some point a website where you could see the latest versions of assemblers, uh, you know, tried on different uh, microbial data sets. I think it's it's very useful and it was super useful um, for us as developers uh, to see different metrics that people, you know, really care about because we were um, also so we had some notion of what we try to, 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 to do, but then uh, it's another uh it's it's very refreshing to see what other people care about and what actual you know downstream analysis needs uh because we were not working so much as bio with the biologists as much as we wanted uh, i think and as much as we needed <laughs> so yeah it was really cool and then uh, different spin off projects started and uh, there was this uh, you know metagenomic version that i was uh, very deeply involved with and there was like a rna seq version uh, of spades and all these different like space for plasmids and so on and so forth um and uh yeah nowadays it's uh i, I think that uh, I, I know the analogy actually the good analogy i think of spades and canoe is that it's a huge code base and so for people who know them right who for for the developers it's a very cool playground uh, because uh, it, it's the same with canoe. So with uh, you know with, with high canoe. So whatever I wanted, I was I, I was asking Serge and Brian uh, how we should implement that. And you know, ninety percent of the times they told me that it's already been something very similar has already been done, and we can just try to reuse it and adapt this module. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And that's what you know made the progress very fast. I think it's the same. It was the same with spades at some point. So we had so much, uh, so many diverse um, uh, modules um, implemented uh, that you know adaptation for each particular you know problem or new data type uh it we could do it fast it it wouldn't mean that we we could do it best so you know specifically designed uh software or algorithm targeting particular uh particular uh problem and particular data type would probably do better than us but then we could prototype fast and you know it's as always like the the simplest tricks give you 90% of the results and then you spend the rest 5 years pushing the, towards the the final 10% which doesn't of, always work in the sequencing and in bioinformatics world because in 5 years the technology is obsolete and nobody cares anymore so so at some in some sense it, it's it's not very cool as uh, it's not very, you know, scientific maybe, but uh, it ends up being very important to be able to uh, to prototype fast if you want to keep up with uh, what's going on uh, and to keep producing useful software. Yeah, I mean, I think that comes back to some of the, the points that, you know, Sergey had brought up before about how parts of Canoe are messy, like the best overlap graph. And if we were making a new assembler from scratch, we might not use that. Uh, but because, you know, we have optimized it somewhat with heuristics and other things and it works quite well for the th current data type you know yeah um, it it works and you can prototype and th then our focus gets diverted to other parts like working on making it applicable to hi-fi data uh, or other kind of things just because there's a lot of code in an assembler that is hard to go through and replace and there's not many Assemble projects that kind of survive for a long time, right? I mean, Spades is one exception, but as Sergey said, there was a pretty large team working on this. Um, and there's often a, an assembly that's developed, and I've been guilty of this myself too during my, you know, PhD, where I developed like a scaffolder that then I never maintain, and so no one's going to use it because I haven't made any updates to it in years. And, and I've so tried. Yeah, exactly. And so it's easy, you know, it's easy to prototype something quick. But to make it survive for many years, you know, you naturally build up this big code base and some things you're not happy with that you're always trying to improve. Um, so I think that it's kind of a double-edged sword. The reason that Solar Assembler and Canoe have lasted so long is because they're so versatile and have so many things implemented. But because they're so versatile and have so many things implemented, there's lots of things that 
were implemented five years ago are still there, but we haven't gone back and tried to look at, see how we could improve it or do better for the current data types. Right. So it's kind of a never ending process of refinement. Um, you know, so in the past, in, you know, past few weeks, we've been looking at improving some of what we're doing in the best overlap graph uh, with Sergey. And then we're looking at, you know, in the future, I want to replace that with something else. And so Sergey was, has been looking at some of that as well. Yeah, so. and uh, from the you know perspective of uh, development of different software, I think that the len the um, we we can first of all the the community is doing a lot of work. Maybe it can do even better job. And we also, I I I've been uh, quite uh, guilty of that myself. I I wasn't you know there are probably many parts of the code base that could be released as a separate you know, libraries, for example, that could facilitate development of other software and prototyping of after the software. Um, but we were not doing it much. And I, I also don't think that many projects, you know, stand up, stemmed up out from the Canoe uh, code base as well. But Serge can correct me if it's not true. Uh, but uh, nowadays, uh, there are uh, different modules out there uh, different libraries out there, uh, which uh, actually, so now you don't need to be, you know, a member of Spades team to prototype different assembly algorithms because you can just, you know, get a GFA graph in GFA format from Spades with all the additional information that you might need and then load it into, you know, your own software and do something, then output it, then compute, I don't know, recompute consensus using some other library. So that's, and I think that's cool. So the, the more, uh, well maintained, you know, formats, uh, and just, you know, modular approach we have, uh, the easier it is for community to experiment. Uh, the downside of this is that it might not work as well as if you are, for example, use all the available information throughout all the modules. So sometimes the monolithic approach will, can produce better results. But it it uh, weighs on you, and it's it's it makes the prototyping harder. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know. It's messy. I don't I don't know what the best what the best approach is for the software development in bioinformatics. I mean, that's an important point. I think um, one of the first kind of projects to try to do this was the Amos package, which was started at the time when Solar Assembler was still proprietary. And so this was the modular open source. That's the MOS and AMOS, right? It's a modular open source <laughs> assembly package, which um, is not much used now because it was targeted primarily to Sanger data and just didn't scale to the Illumina data sets. But um, the idea there was that you know we would implement some useful modules. I say we, uh, I worked a little bit on it when I was in grad school, but it was started before me. Um, and then you know, you'd have something that can compute overlaps between reads and something that could build a graph from them. And then if you had a clever idea to filter the overlaps or to build the graph differently, you could just try that and then everything else would be available, right? Um, and you know, that was quite useful in, from my personal experience, I can say it was useful because I worked on a scaffolder during my PhD for metagenomic data. Um, and so it was much easier to have that infrastructure that I didn't have to develop all these things from scratch. Um, and, you know, more recently, there's been some focus on interchangeable format. Uh, you know, Sergey mentioned GFA. Um, there's this uh, PATH format, which is sort of a derivative of the format that the Blazor, the PagBioMapper put out that uh, hangs standardized with uh, mini map and mini ASM. Um, and so, you know, uh, within Canoe, we've tried to be conscious of that and and put in places where you know it has internal databases that are all binary on disk or in memory, but then you can convert them, try to make it so that you can convert them to these formats, um, which doesn't always translate like Sergey said one hundred percent because it's hard to capture some of that information in some of the formats, uh, but make it easier. So if you wanted to plug in something and replace Canoe's overlaps. Um, you could do that, and I know of at least one or two projects that have done that. Um, and 
or if you wanted to replace the the best overlap graph with something else, you could take the overlaps we computed with all the whatever adjustments we've made to them, corrections to the reads, et cetera, and use them. Um, but the Vertebra Genome Project has also done this. I'll I'll plug that one format from the Vertebra Genome Project that's on GitHub that, as part of the Vertebra Genome Project GitHub um, organization that tries to define some interchangeable assembly formats exactly because of this reason, because we don't want to make everyone who wants has a, an idea for a better piece of the assembler to have to write everything else up and downstream of that, because that's obviously very, very expensive uh, time-wise uh, and effort-wise, right? So um, I think having these kind of, I, I think having the formats be interchangeable is probably the right approach, more so than having kind of a lot of the modules and things implemented in one place like Amos was trying to do, uh, because that gives more freedom because then, you know, you don't have to play in that one kind of project or playground. As long as you have an intermediate step where you can dump a format that other people can, you know, recognize and read and, and write out, um, it makes it easy to have five or 10 projects, which all have different versions that you can plug and play and, you know, make a third one that combines you know, parts A and B from project one, C and D from project two, and F from project three um, in a modular way. And so I think as a community, an assembly community, that's something we want to move towards. And we've kind of slowly been moving there, but, um, you know, it would be nice to to get it more usable and, and more standardized and get people, um, you know, facilitate this kind of rapid development because given how fast sequencing technology is changing, that benefits everyone uh, the uh, developers, the users, everyone that we can get faster prototyping, faster development, faster ideas out there. And so just to close the the discussion of spades, uh, Sergei, you, you promised us a cool story about, about the oh, name. Oh, about I, the name. Uh, I always assume that SP in space stand for St. Petersburg. Yeah, but, yeah uh, right. So we, we try to, to have some name with SP and A there. So at least SP, but we wanted SPA because uh, assembler. So right. yeah, so it's it stands for like Saint Petersburg Assembler, but also you know in, immediately I had this picture in mind that we would all have the cards, um, you know our uh, business cards uh, would have uh, you know Spades logo on the other side and would look like a card deck, and <laughs> we actually we actually had those. So a friend of mine she she. Um, was doing design back then and she drew this logo and uh, made a, um, a prototype of those cards and uh, yeah uh, it's been uh, it's been quite cool okay so uh, now let's return to canoe and we talked about some of the uh, concepts uh, behind canoe but just to maybe systematize that information can you describe the whole canoe uh, pipeline uh, sure. Um, so it's based on this idea of a hierarchical assembly. So we try to improve the reads as much as we can before we actually do anything with them. Um, so a standard run of Canoe, if you gave it, you know, raw pack bio or nanopore data, um, the first step is it'll compute all the overlaps between the reads. Um, it will use that to generate new consensus sequences for the read. So it'll actually change each individual read, uh, trim it potentially, uh, split it into multiple ones. But now each read which, ha which will have much higher identity quality. Um, and so then in the next step, what we do is uh, use the overlaps, recompute the overlaps again on these new consensus reads um, and trim them uh, and identify chimera or other kind of weird sequencing artifacts that come from these instruments sometimes. Um, and the reason you do this uh, again is because uh, you've changed the read so much in that first correction step that, you know, when you were tolerating like 30% difference in your overlap, you may have missed that there's a couple of bases wrong here. But now that you've improved the read so much, you can say, well, this read has everything is good except the last four bases, and you can be much more precise than you would have been. Uh, it would have just been washed out at your initial um, error rate that you have to deal with for this data. And so once you do that and you've um, corrected the reads and you've trimmed them to their best sequences that you believe that are trustworthy, um, you then compute the overlaps for the last time, um, build this um, overlap graph 
uh, the best overlap graph uh, to generate layouts. Um, these layouts are initially greedy, as Sergey mentioned. So you just take the longest paths through, eliminate all the reads that you used, take the next longest path through, eliminate all the reads, and do that until you have nothing left. Um, then you go back and try to fix any mistakes if you see evidence that you took a path where there was a branch, because you're taking a greedy path. You can you don't have to stop at a branch if you're just going through a greedy walk, right? Um, if you see that you missed a branch that you care about that you likely got wrong. Uh, or don't know that you got right, at least don't have any evidence you got it right, um, you split. Um, and this gives you your contigs. Um, and then the final step in Canoe is to then take these layouts of these contigs, actually take all the read sequence, because all these best overlap graphs and all these um, operations work without ever looking at the read sequences themselves. Um, in the last step, you look at the read sequences, you align them based on the layouts that you've built from your graph. Um, so, you know, where it says A, read A, overlaps read B by this much. So you try to actually align that. Uh, uh, and then you align all the reads that were contained that you didn't use in your graph because we throw out all the contained reads from our graph as a very first step. Uh, because the idea is that they don't add anything to your traversal, which is not quite true, as Sergey maybe you can comment on because he's been thinking about this a lot. Um, but for the most part, it's true, uh, as long as your reads are not too different in length. Um, and then you, but you want to bring them back in at the very end because uh, they give you information. While they may not give you information about how to walk the graph of the genome, they give you information about what the sequence is at that locus of the genome, right? Um, and so you bring all those in, you align them uh, again, and you call a consensus, which in our case is just uh, a uh, majority variant uh, call where you build this uh, a DAG from the uh, layout, and then at every position, you take the majority um, path that you have for a vote, and that gives you your final consensus of your context. So that's kind of the brief overview of the whole canoe pipeline. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the innovations behind canoe was the way you find, you can quickly find uh, overlaps between the reads and uh, that uses something uh, called mint hashing uh, that, that you worked on. So can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so we had been doing this kind of hierarchical strategy for a while. Uh, as I mentioned, when we first modified Solera Assembler to do this, um, we, we were doing a similar strategy, except we're using Illumina 454 reads. Um, as the reads got better and longer, we could we, we actually could do a better job correcting reads with the other uh, noisy reads like BackBio and Anapur themselves. But we had the problem that we were using old code that was developed for the original Solera assembler um, and for Sanger length reads to find these overlaps. And so the first time we tried to do a large genome like a, a Drosophila, a, a fruit fly genome, uh, you know, it took several hundred thousand CPU hours to compute those overlaps, which is obviously... Uh, at the time, we were gearing towards trying to do a goat genome, uh, which is a three gigabase genome about like a human. Um, and so the Drosophila genome is 150 megabases by comparison. So essentially, the goat genome would have been untractable. Um, and our collaborator, uh, Tim Smith at the USDA, who has been a longtime collaborator on these PacBio projects, you know, called us up and said, like, you guys, uh, you told us we we're going to do this goat. How are we going to do this if it's going to take you, you know, millions and millions of CPU hours? Where are you going to get these CPU hours? And uh, we said, don't worry, we have an idea. It's going to work. Like, trust us, it'll work out. Um, and so at the time, uh, my friend from undergrad and grad school, Constantine Berlin, uh, was actually working on protein folding um, and uh, NMR nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, like and, and modeling what the protein looks like based on that data. Um, but he had also had some background in numerical analysis, um, and I had started talking to him about these kind of issues that we were having, and he told me about this min hashing approach, uh, which was proposed um, by Andre Berdur for. Um, finding similar web pages in searches, so eliminating um, similar matches. If you, for example, search and you want to tell if these two web pages are largely similar, you obviously can't compare the entire web page to another entire web page. It'll take too long. And so they had this idea of shingles where you took a subset of words uh, in this document. And the idea is that uh, if the words, uh, what you're uh, going to estimate is this Jacquard similarity, which is how many words are shared out of all the words in these two documents. 
Um, and the idea for min hashing is really simple. Uh, it's that if two words, if two documents are really similar, they should share more words. So if you just randomly um, selected words from both documents, um, then you should be more likely to pick the same word from the two documents when they have more similar words than two documents that are not similar. And so the nice thing is that this is independent of the size of the document. Um, and so you could take a, a fixed size sketch, so a fixed number of words, say a thousand words, um, and you would have a good estimate of the similarity of the documents. Um, and so we applied this same idea to overlapping uh, where we took uh, kmers now instead of words, um, and we hashed them all, um, and then we recorded. Uh, you know, for every read, we had these words that we had hashed and selected to represent that word, um, and then we uh, used that to identify which which uh, reads are likely to be similar based on these hashed kmers, and so that could eliminate a lot of false uh, positive matches because we could be uh, you know, we could have various requirements based on if we model what the similarity of the reads we expect to be. We can estimate how many kmers we should have hashed in common, um, and so we can then set thresholds correctly and say, okay, these reads are probably not similar to each other. These reads are, and so we will investigate them further and look in detail at the actual regions where they are similar and how similar they are, um, and try to estimate that. Um, and so that was the first version of this that. Um, was actually predates uh, Solera Assem uh, or Canoe that was part of Solera Assembler. Um, and we, we published that. Uh, and then after that, we started working on other idea, other applications of this minhash idea uh, out of which uh, the MASH project came out. Um, and this was you know comparing uh, and searching a database of whole genomes. So if you wanted to say, is this e. coli, how similar is this e. coli to some other random genome you have? Um, and a couple of important things came out of that. Uh, one of them is the relation between this Jacquard similarity uh, and the nucleotide identity that people are used to using, right? Because Jacquard is not a very intuitive concept necessarily. Um, and so uh, we had this formula from MASH that lets you convert a Jacquard similarity to say this is actually 90% identity, um, assuming random sequence uh, error, et cetera, um, and modeling it as binomial. Um, but uh, we also had this other idea from this document searching is there's this concept of uh, TF-IDF weighting, um, term frequency inverse document frequency, which is useful. Uh, if you think about the English language, there's a lot of filler words that are not very informative, but they're very, very common, right? So like think articles like the, uh, of, you know, if you know that your text has 10,000 copies of of, that doesn't really tell you what it's about. Um, and so this idea, we thought, is very analogous to repeats in genome sequences. And so, you know, if you have this repeat sequence and you have a thousand copies of it, that doesn't really tell you if two regions of the genome are similar or not, because you expect to find that everywhere anyway. Um, and so we added these two features to um, MHAP, which is our original min hashing tool. Um, that was part of Solera Assembler. Uh, so we added two features. One is that it could use this uh, estimate of identity, which made the filtering and thresholding much easier for us to set and estimate rather than trying to model the jacquards like we were doing before. Uh, and we added this feature where if we had kmers that were very common, uh, we could say, uh, we could weigh our, uh, when we were picking this sketch, you know, the, what is the representative set of kmers for this read, we would bias ourselves away from picking kmers that we know are repetitive uh, and bias ourselves towards kmers that are unique to those reads uh, using this TFIDF idea. Um, and so the nice thing about that is that now you don't have to have a hard, hard filter like a lot of overlappers usually say, if a kmer occurs more than x times, I'm just never going to look at it. Um, we could look at all kmers still, but we would just be very unlikely to pick the ones that are very, very repetitive if we had a better option. Um, and so that made uh, the overlapping much faster, and it made it more accurate when you had different uh, levels of coverage uh, in your data set. So if you had some things at high coverage, like a plasmid, and some things at low coverage, like the nuclear genome, you didn't have to worry about how do I set a threshold if something occurs 10 times in the plasmid and once in the genome, is that the plasmid repetitive or not? Um, 
you would still find all the overlaps within the plasmid. Um, and so those two main ideas were the changes we made to Canoe, which made it made the MHAP step much, much faster as a result. Um, and then, you know, also the cleaning up of the code from Solar Assembler. Uh, those were the main things that went into the first Canoe publication. But it was also way before um, Minimap, right? I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the min hashing, the MHAP idea was um, one of the first applications of this min hash uh, kind of sketching idea to bioinformatics. There was some limited work, um, I think, in the late 90s, early, early 2000s, I guess, um, where people had used it for some similarity um, searching, but it had been kind of forgotten and not and not used in bioinformatics for a long time. Right. No, no, I, I meant mostly that at that point, there was uh, actually no other w good way to compute the overlap between no long noisy reads, right? So right, now, fast, now, yeah. nowadays, everybody can take a mini map and it will produce reasonable results. Right. Although there are some catches with respect to assembling complex genomes, but uh, for general use, it's it's fine. But at, the mo at that moment, there was nothing, right? Yeah, there was nothing. This it predates both uh, Minimap and uh, DLiner, which is the tool that Gene Myers developed, um, which also was trying to solve the same problem of how do you find all these um, overlaps between reads fast enough to be able to use them for assembly. Um, and so it was kind of the uh, our paper where we used this tool was the first one to show a whole genome assembly of a mammal genome like a human uh, was now possible from long read data, which before would have taken, you know, millions of CPU hours, it would have been impractical really to do it. Yeah. And one of the other key ideas that came out of that, which is, you reminded me because you brought up Minimap, is that um, you don't actually, before that, all the overlapping had been focused on finding an actual alignment, whereas, you know, you do a dynamic programming or something to actually find a base by base correspondence between reads that you're looking at. Um, and so we said in the original MHAP paper that we can estimate that this will have a good alignment anyway. We don't really need to do the full alignment. We can tell you this is pretty good. And this one is not very good, right? Um, and we can discriminate them, the levels of good and bad without having that step. Um, and so we essentially threw out this expensive step um, without sacrificing the quality uh, of the overlaps that you're finding. Uh, and this is similar to what uh, mini uh, map is doing in mini, in mini ASM that they throw out that information as well, all the way through the assembly actually, right? Um, and so that idea has gained some traction that, and it does actually seem to work that you can estimate from these kind of Kamer statistics, you can estimate the information that you would be getting from a dynamic programming and be pretty accurate about saying what is a good overlap, what is not a good overlap. Right, and another. I I don't think you mentioned Mesh Map, right? Which is the the the, the latest installment of uh, this idea from uh, our lab, led by efforts led by Chirag Jain. Yep. Um. Right. And uh, yeah, Raman, if your listeners are not familiar with this work, uh, it's it's pretty cool, and uh, yeah, it's it's also a map uh, like it supports local uh, alignments. I think of. Uh, you know, so if if you have your genome and you're interested in aligning all of its, you know, 5K windows to the entire RefSeq database, for example, it can do that uh, in reasonable amount of time and memory. Um, and also, they, for example, they sh showed how you can do pairwise comparison, uh, pairwise ANI, uh, which is average nucleotide identity index. Computation across like ninety thousand different bacterial genomes, um, and then show you know whether there actually is a species boundary at ninety five percent ANI. Um, but yeah, so it it makes uh, this um, uh, you know f uh, it makes alignment of big uh, queries to large databases. Uh, fast and it also doesn't do it uh, based on you know nucleotide by nucleotide uh, comparison, um, but it uses this um, sketches uh, and gives you correct result with essentially high probability, uh, right? And you can you can estimate um, the the probability that you you missed uh, something. Um, 
So yeah, it's it's pretty cool work. So check it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the min hashing has been a quite cool thing that we've applied, starting with the assembly and then mash and then mash map. I mean it's 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 a really simple intuitive idea, but it's extremely versatile uh, in the kind of problems it can be applied to, especially with some of these modifications that um, actually uh, Chirag Jane, who is the author of MashMap and this fast I tools that Sergey mentioned um, and is currently a postdoc in our lab after being a summer student uh, when he developed all these tools, um, he's looking at ways that you can apply some of these TF IDF ideas that we used in assembly to mapping as well. So how do you avoid, you know, how do you map to repeat regions in the genome correctly, uh, given that the typical approach is just to throw all of them away and not try to map reads where they have these repeats? Can we actually do better than that and try to uh, map in those repeat regions? Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a very cool and versatile idea. Um, that... Yeah, but interestingly, in Haikanu, we go to a completely different direction, right? In, so it, no sketches will be enough. For us, we are going base by base and uh, looking at the very at the highest resolution possible that we can achieve. <laughs> so yeah, I would love to, do, to 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 use some sketches, but unfortunately, I, I I wasn't able to yet. This concludes the first part of our conversation with Sergey Nurkan and Sergey Korin. In the next episode, you'll hear the rest of this conversation where we talk specifically about hi-fi reads and high canoes. So stay tuned.